Welcome back to this series, everyone. Um, in this episode, we will focus on the restoration of the motherboard. But I just wanted to um, put in <laughs> some footage of my servicing the fan because somebody commented that I had forgotten to do that. I had forgotten to actually put it in the film, <laughs> in the video, but I didn't forget to do it. I lubricated it, I cleaned it, and uh, once it was serviced, it was turning very smoothly. <laughs> that it was gliding on its rails so that's that's what i had done uh, previous time and i just forget uh, to show it now um, once you confront the motherboard the first thing that jumps out is the pitch look look at that fine pitch that the design rules are pretty advanced for a 1976 board and it has clearly been designed with automated CAD tools and not by hand like other computers of the time, even later, like the ZX80 and the ZX81. Uh, these, is, these are very fine pitch rules that you see there. Uh, the vias are pretty large uh, and filled with solder, but we didn't know yet at the time that all the energy goes on, on the outside uh, of the vias, that you can fill them with jam <laughs> and it will not uh, uh, um, uh, reduce the performance. So to take the motherboard out, um, I had to disassemble some more. I had to remove uh, the backplane connector. It's tricky to do that. You have to have the right tip for your screwdriver. You may have to lubricate the screws a little bit to soften them, make it easier to remove them. But uh, at the end, after you remove, I don't know, a dozen screws, uh, uh, you can just pull it out. I put some deoxid uh, on the slot to make it easier to pull it out. And there we go. There goes the, the expansion, the, the, the backplane for the expansion cards. Now, when you look at the motherboard, it seems to be riveted. You see, there are six visible rivets that seem to rivet it to, to, to the chassis. So how do you take it out? Well, the secret is that underneath these uh, rivets, there goes the screw and the screw is at the bottom. And there are eight of them. Um, two of the screw points are hidden underneath um, the slot for the backplane connector. The other six can be seen on, on the top of the board in the form of rivets. So you just have to remove all eight screws and, uh, and uh, the motherboard will be freed and we can work on it and solder and disolder things on it. Uh, at first I thought, how can I work on this board if it's riveted? Do I have to drill it? But no, we don't have to drill it. It, it just comes out smoothly once you've unscrewed it enough. Now, um, I removed, first thing, I removed all the more delicate chips and the chips that require multiple power, power rails. I will explain uh, later why in a future episode. Um, I regretted removing the DIP4, DIP40 uh, chips, the large chips, including the CPU, using this uh, method that you saw me use. It's better to just use a proper chip pooling tool that removes the chip vertically. And the reason is those gold pins, they are very malleable, they are very fragile, and, uh, and I damaged two of them, one in the CPU and one um, in, in the ROM, um, in the um, uh, personality card. Uh, I could fix it, it's no problem, but uh, gold is a very malleable metal. So if you're restoring a Sol 20, uh, be extra careful uh, of those gold uh, pins. They're very fragile, they can even be corroded. So I finished removing um, everything that uh, require multiple uh, power rails, except for the personality card, which you will see me putting back in. That was a mistake. It was not a problem, but I wanted to remove everything that uses two power rails. Um, I even removed the memories that you can see there on the left. I thought those were DRAMs requiring multiple power rails, but it turns out they are SRAMs and they only take five volts. So I could have left them in, but okay. Now I'm just cleaning the board with some foam pads and uh, IPA. Uh, it was not so dirty that would require me to give it a bath in distilled water and all that stuff. Uh, just some, some foam and IPA was sufficient. I put the oxid on that backplane connector there. You probably saw me do that earlier. I'm just cleaning the excess now. Now, next step is to look at the capacitors. There is one prominent radio electrolytic capacitor 
Um, these things can leak electrolyte if they are not okay. So they are safety issue, a liability issue uh, on this board. So I wanted to remove it and measure it off circuit to make sure that uh, it's still in good shape. Um, so there goes the capacitor, it's out now. I'm just cleaning the pads. I used very low temperature to pull it out 340 Celsius, so no damage. Now I'm going to test that electrolytic capacitor. It's supposed to be 100 micro, 16 volts. Um, and um, as you see there, it will, it, was, it will be 127 micro, so higher cap uh, capacitance. And 0 0.2 ohm, 0 0.2 something ohm ESR. I'm checking to make sure it's okay. And it is okay. But still, the capacitor is now out. Do I put it back in, um, even though it tests okay? If I have a replacement in my stock, and I did, look, it, 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 it's an, the same capacitor, 100 microfarad, just 63 volts instead of 16, but it's the same height, the same diameter, the same lead pitch, and it looks almost the same, and I thought, do I dare put the old one back now that I went through the trouble of removing it, and I decided not to. I just replaced with a brand new radio capacitor, and uh, um, I... I, I made a little film of it to show you that it belongs right there. It doesn't look odd at all. And it has the safety valve on top. So if it leaks, it's not going to destroy the board and it's never going to leak. It's a good quality capacitor. Now those Axial capacitors in orange, I have nothing that could replace them. They have very low capacitance value um, and uh, I have nothing that could look like them, orange like that. So I left them in, they tested okay. And I'm checking the impedance between the 5 volt line and ground and look, 57 ohms only. Anything below 100 ohm is suspicious. I'm checking it at the leads of one of the decoupling capacitors as well. But uh, this is far below 100 ohms, so I am suspicious of this. Um, there seems to be something short, almost shorting to ground somewhere. So I started testing the discrete components offline with my multimeter, either in continuance mode or diode mode. And uh, looking around the board, I only found two suspicious results. You can never be sure because it's in circuit testing and in circuit, you can never know for sure. But two components I, th I thought were suspicious. One was the decoupling capacitor on the five volt line. So I put it to measure, to, to measure it off circuit and it tested. Okay, so that was not a problem at all. Um, it's a tantalum capacitor. And then there was this, this Zener diode that was testing ambiguously in circuit. So I also pulled it, decided to test it off circuit, um, uh, but, it, but it tested okay as well. So it, there was no issues with the discrete component. So whatever is reducing the impedance from five volt to ground is a chip. Um, but before I went that, that, that uh, route, I checked the board um, with a magnifying glass and my multimeter in continuity mode. There was nothing wrong with the board. So I then I put my multimeter measuring the impedance between 5 volts and ground. That's what you see there now, 58, volt, uh, 58 ohms. And now look, if I pull that chip out of the board, all chips are socketed. So it's very easy to debug this board. If I pull that particular chip out, look, 58 ohms. Once the chip comes out, you will see what happens. Look at that, 92 ohms. So this chip was responsible for almost 40 ohm reduction uh, in the impedance of the 5 volt rail. This is definitely defective. There were four other chips, I'm showing you three. There were four other chips that had a, also an effect. So look at this one. This one, we go from 92 to 96, so four ohm reduction uh, in the impedance. Um, I think I'm going to show you a, a third one as well. But this is the kind of thing that you can put these chips in a, in a logic tester and they may even pass. The logic may be okay. The problem is electrical. Um, um, and even if they pass a the logic test, eventually they, <laughs> they will go bust. So I replaced uh, three, of the, three of the four. Um, uh, this one was the worst, was bringing the impedance down by 40 ohms. So I put it in a logic tester and it fails in the logic tester as well. The logic tester doesn't even recognize the chip. Uh, as you can see there, if I do an auto find, uh, it doesn't even recognize the chip. This one was completely busted. Uh, two of the four actually passed the logic test. 
um, but I replaced three and I left only one of the four in because that one was bringing the impedance down by only one ohm. Um, and, uh, and I didn't have a replacement. So that one is still in, the other three um, have been replaced. I checked what the chip number was, so I can manually uh, choose a, uh, um, a test vector for it. So you see, I can't auto find it, so I will manually uh, pick the chip. That's uh, 109, so I then run the test vector in it, and it fails too. Uh, it fails in, let's see, one point. In one um, bit of the test vector, it uh, just fails. Again, uh, two of the others passed, but I replaced three out of the four anyway. Now look, this is one of them. This is the one that brought the impedance down by four ohms. If I measure the impedance from VCC to ground on the old chip, I get 2.8 kilo ohm yeah 2.8 kilo ohm that's fairly low and to give you a comparison let's measure a brand new chip the same chip but brand new i just took it out of the package and we have 41 mega ohm impedance from vcc to ground so although this chip actually passed the logic test it should be replaced and then since every chip on this board is socketed i just took each one of them out and I run a logic test on them uh, on my tester. I don't recommend this tester, by the way, it's very expensive and not worth the price. But I have it, so I used it. Um, so for each chip I, I, I tested it. Sometimes the auto find gives you a list, so you have to know <laughs> um, what chip it is. So I had to remove it and look it under the magnifying glass so I know which test vectors to choose. So I tested each one of them individually and I cleaned their sockets, lubricated um, their sockets. Often I cleaned their pins with a fiberglass pen and I lubricated their pins as well to remove wherever corrosion was there. Um, but there were no other effective chip other than the ones that were bringing down the impedance of the 5 volt rail. And this is my little process for uh, uh, cleaning and lubricating uh, the sockets. I am using the Oxit uh, D5 on a, on a dropper. Uh, even though it's a flush action thing, um, the Deoxid D5 can is terrible. And this is a mod underneath the motherboard. I used some uh, transient voltage suppression diodes on the power rails uh, as an extra safety measurement measure and uh, they're going to be hidden anyway underneath the board. Now look, the CPU pin bent just when I pushed into the ESD safe foam. That fragile they were, I think they were corroded um, as well. It's easy to fix, um, it, this happened also on the ROM of the personality card. I fixed and reinforced the pins that were not looking too good. And then I repopulated the board and the result is what you're about to see. Uh, there are two replaced chips at this point when I, when I uh, shot this video, uh, this sequence, but I actually replaced three. So this is it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next time for episode three. Take care.